will lead into Brother Phelan. So any volunteers for a prayer? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to have the opportunity to be able to learn about unity today um, for the speakers and presenters who have taken the time to prepare a presentation for us and help us out. We can be attentive and have the spirit with us. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All yours. So, one of the things I just want to start out with, how many of you have taken uh, CS246, Android Studio, Java development? So, one of the frustrating things about Android Studio development is when you start searching for tutorials about how to do stuff, because Android Studio has changed so much, and Android has changed so much, that a lot of times you'll find tutorials that will show you the exact wrong way to do it now. And Unity is even worse than that. Unity is even worse than that because Unity has been around for a long time and has undergone five major revisions. We're currently on Unity 5. And so a lot of things that previously, if you look, how do I do this in Unity? You'll often find people that will say, you can't do that in Unity, when in fact you can do it in Unity. Or you'll find really difficult ways to do it when in fact it is a lot easier now. Now I'm not going to, this is not a how to use Unity demo. We have about 30 minutes, right? Yeah. And it would take probably a whole semester to cover everything in Unity. So 30 minutes just isn't going to cut it. So I'm going to kind of give you a whirlwind tour of the interface. But mainly what I want to talk about is the coding paradigm that Unity uses, which is something called behavior or component-based programming, which is different than object-oriented programming or procedural programming. So if you want to follow along, if you already have Unity downloaded, that'll be good. If you don't, then there's no chance of you doing that in the next 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. But what you can do is you can just create a new project. And we'll just call this demo project. And down here at the bottom, you can see there's a toggle to be able to switch between 2D and 3D. So Unity has some presets, which will make setting up the camera and things a little easier, depending on whether you want to do a 3D type perspective game or two dimensional game. It doesn't really matter because we're just going to import a game from the asset store. So we'll just create that. Going to load everything up. And so the way your, your interface looks, you can have multiple layouts. So this is how mine is set up. Yours may look slightly different. But the thing I'm going to do first is just go to the asset store, which is here in the window menu. And I'm just going to search for Space Shooter, which is a Unity created tutorial. And once I find that, I'll click Import. You may have to click Download if you've never done it before. And what this will do is it'll just bring in everything for this game into my current project. So it's going to pull all that in. Slowly. Surely. And now we have the game loaded. So I'll close this tab. And down here under done, we'll have a thing called a scene. Every level in Unity is called a scene. So a scene is just a collection of rules and game assets that go together to form a level. So if I double click that scene, I will see this, which is obviously a pretty cool game, right? We can see that right off. <laughs> that was a joke. So the thing about game programming in Unity is there are two ways to do it. One is you can set up your assets into this 2D or 3D world and arrange them just the way you want. The other way is you can use kind of a script-based approach, which is what most people do for larger games. So if we want to see what this game looks like, we can click the Game Preview tab, which will give us a better idea of what this is going to do. So I'm going to just demo this game and hope that I can... So this is pretty cool, right? This is basically Steve from 165. We've done that project. 
So we have these enemy ships, these asteroids. Notice that the asteroids kind of rotate. You notice that the enemy ships, if there are any more enemy ships, they don't seem to be. The enemy ships, they can have this kind of evasive action thing that they do. So they kind of swing back and forth. The other thing you notice is that even though this is a 2D game, as I turn the ship back and forth, there's a three-dimensional component to it. I'm not very good at that. What are you using to shoot? Uh, the mouse button. So what I want to talk about, though, is how the logic for this game is set up. So Unity uses a standard game loop, although it's quite a bit more complex than game loops you might be used to. So basically, every component inside the game has the option of doing something when the game first starts, when the component is first loaded. At that point, there are two different update calls that are used. This one is called fixed update, and it happens on a periodic timer independent of the frame rate. Any physics-based calculations happen here, because everything we do with physics is dependent on time. And so if we have things falling, or if we have things flying across the screen, or bumping into each other, those are things we check inside of this event. The update event happens every frame, and so you may have more or fewer updates depending on the frame rate that you're running on. So you don't want to do time-based calculations inside of update. And there are lots of other events that I'm not going to talk about. So to give you an example, let's take a look at the player component. So when I click on the player object here, you see on the right there is a list of components. Each of these components adds a different set of behaviors and properties to my ship. Every component has a transform, which is basically its location and orientation in three-dimensional space. So even though this is a two-dimensional game, every component in Unity has a three-dimensional coordinate system. So I can see its position, its rotation, and its scale. Now, since this is a 3D model, the other thing I have is I have a mesh renderer. The mesh renderer basically lets me have a beautiful piece of art that you can't really see because it's wrapped around a sphere down here. But trust me that it looks like a spaceship. And so what the mesh, this is designed in some three-dimensional modeling program and then imported into Unity. Unity doesn't have any three-dimensional modeling tools or object modeling tools. We import all of those assets separately. The other thing that my ship has is a rigid body component. By adding this component, it allows physics to apply to this, this object. Anything with a rigid body component is affected by physics. Now, you can tweak different properties, such as the mass, whether it should defy gravity, and some other things, such as how viscosity and drag would work. And then the final thing that's important to see is this mesh collider, because we want our our ship to be able to run into stuff. So this little green outline around my ship defines the boundary of the ship. Typically in Unity, what you'll see is really complex models will not use a complex mesh for the collider. It'll have some kind of big sphere wrapped around it or a cylinder wrapped around it to represent the object. And it'll say, if you come into the bounds of this sphere, you have been hit by whatever is coming into there. But since we just have a little triangle, we can apply a mesh collider so that if an asteroid comes right here, we don't die. But if it comes right there, we do. So we can have finer precision on a simpler model. The other components that are here, we can have as many components as we want. And these are not used directly. They're used by scripts that are attached to it. Every script can add a behavior to the, to the object. So in this case, we have a script here called player controller. So if we look at the code for this script, and this is written in C sharp, but Unity, you can use JavaScript as well, you'll see that there are a couple of important functions inside of this script. One is the update function that will happen every frame, every draw call, this update function will be called. And all it's doing is asking if we're pressing the fire button, 
then we are going to, we have a kind of a limiter here on how often we can shoot. And if we are pressing the fire button, we are going to create a shot. That shot will be created in this position with this orientation. Then we're going to play a sound. Now this call is important because it says, I don't know what sound I'm playing. I just know there's a component on me that is an audio source, and I'm going to play that sound. So if we go back to the interface, we can see this audio source component here. So this sound pretty high tech, right? So this is the sound that's attached to that component. So I can swap that out by just dragging a different sound to that location. But whatever sound is placed here, when the player fires the that's the sound that will get played. Now, if I remove this component, and I can disable it temporarily by hitting this, then the script will still run, but when it says, when it says to get the component with the audio source, it won't find anything, so there'll be nothing to play. So we can, again, add and subtract behavior to our game objects based on what components are there. So questions so far about this component-based approach. We're going to go more into this, and it'll get interesting here in a minute. Yes? So does it, like, pass an old sound or something like that? Yes. Yeah. Or one that just no ops? Yeah, so basically what will happen is if the get component returns, doesn't, if that component doesn't exist, it will return null. That doesn't crash it. No. So it depends what you do with it. In this case, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah and there's some rules about that that are kind of detailed. But, yeah. Now notice again down here, our player ship has a fixed update function. All of the physics related to the movement happens here. And again, to kind of underscore this idea, if we go back and look at our renderer for our player ship, We can see that our ship is, in fact, a 3D model. We're just looking at it from a top-down view. But when we call, when we are pushing the left and right button, we do rotate it kind of to the side down here with this rotation bit. Okay. Now, I want to look at these asteroids. So the other thing that Unity uses are called the thing that I want to talk about are called prefabs. Everything in the game is either an object or a prefab or both. So an object is something that exists in your game world. If you find that you reuse that object a lot, you can create what's called a prefab out of it, which is basically a template that you can then use to create multiple instances of that thing. And every instance will have the same properties as the prefab. So in the way they've set this up, everything is, in fact, set up as prefabs. So if we look at this asteroid, we see that our asteroid has a transform, because every object in Unity has a transform. It has a rigid body, because if it didn't have a rigid body, physics wouldn't affect it. And it also has three different scripts. This one, the mover script, basically just allows whatever is attached to it to move. This is the con destroy by contact script. Anything with this script can be destroyed by contact with something else. And this is the random rotator script. Anything with this script will rotate randomly. So if we look at the code for those, first of all, the mover script is pretty basic. At the beginning, it just says set my initial velocity to whatever speed is. Now you'll notice that the speed variable is a public variable inside of this class. Any public variable that's part of a component will show up in the GUI. So you can modify those without changing the code. Anything that's public will show up here, which is kind of handy. The destroy by contact script does a couple of things. 
At the very beginning of the game, it gets a copy of the game controller script, which we'll look at in a minute. Then it says, if something runs into me, so anything with a collider can run into this. So if anything runs into me, first check if it's a boundary or an enemy. If it is, don't do anything. If an enemy ship runs into an asteroid, doesn't matter. If there is an explosion variable set on me, I'm going to show the explosion. If the thing that ran into me is the player, I'm going to show the player explosion and then end the game. Otherwise, if something ran into me, I'm going to increment the score and destroy the thing and destroy myself. So that means anything with this can be destroyed by anything. So if the player ship runs into it, it'll be game over. Then it, the player ship and the thing will be destroyed. If a laser runs into this, then it will increment the score, destroy the laser, and destroy itself. So by having this all packaged into one component, we can make anything affected by the lasers or by running into it that we want. Questions about how that component idea works. Yeah. So when you say uh, game object, there at the bottom of the last one of those is programs and game objects. Is that just uh, like a pointer to itself or a reference to itself? Yeah. So this one here, you mean? Yeah. So that's a reference to itself. Okay. It's like the base class. Yeah. It says whatever this component is attached to. Okay. So we get that as part of being the uh, inheriting for mono behavior. So would you recommend having all the logic just in the asteroid or like in the asteroid or, and some of it in the player, some of it in the laser? So the, the idea with component-based stuff, it's almost like imagine a component as a special power. Anything you want to ha give a special power to, would, that power would be in the component and whatever wants that power would have the component. So if you imagine like traditional a traditional uh, inheritance model. So if we were setting this up, you know, from a 165 class diagram point of view, we might say, well, we have things that fly around, and we have a player and an enemy. And an enemy can either be a rock or a ship. And those behave differently. And anything that lives in here can be destroyed by the player. But then what if I want to introduce something else that is not an enemy that I can still destroy? Maybe a background piece of background scenery. If we're running through a level on a 3D platform shooter, you might have some crates or some barrels you want to blow up because crates and barrels are everywhere in 3D platform shooters. And so if I wanted to do the, inherit that behavior, I would have to make my barrel an enemy. Now, obviously, the barrel is not my enemy, but I still want it to blow up. And so I have to think about how do I refactor this? Maybe I create an explodable interface or an explodable superclass that enemy inherits from, and then barrel can inherit from that. But that starts to, my class diagram starts to get really messy. By instead saying, I'm not worried about what these objects are, but rather what attributes and behaviors they have, we can split those behaviors into separate units and apply those behaviors wherever we want. Okay. Any other questions before we start to modify the laws of physics? Yes. So when working with this engine, what programming languages does it accept outside of Java and C Sharp? So it accepts C Sharp. JavaScript, and it's a proprietary language that used to be called Boo Script, but I think is called Unity Script now. But I don't think anybody uses that. Most people use C Sharp for it. Um, and there are a few people that use JavaScript, but most people use C Sharp. But honestly, the parts of C Sharp and JavaScript that you're using in this are so limited most of the time that it typically doesn't matter which you use, as long as you can kind of understand the idea of assigning a variable, looping through an array, checking a Boolean condition. Those are pretty much what we're doing. Most of what we do is interfacing with the Unity API to be able to grab components and call functions on them. 
All right, one thing I want to look at, we go back to our asteroid again. So again, asteroid can be destroyed by contact. It can move. We also have a laser here. So this is our laser. It has a collider, which means it can run into things and it can move. This is the enemy ship. Now I want to show you the enemy ship has a weapon controller script. The weapon controller script basically says, at the start, invoke repeating this method, which says, I'm going to repeat this method over and over again after a certain delay at a certain rate. So this fire method will get called periodically based on these variables, the timing that we set there. And what it's going to do is create a bullet and play a sound. The bullet, notice that the fire method does not tell the <coughs> bullet to move. It doesn't tell the bullet how to behave. It doesn't tell it anything except its initial position and which way it's oriented in space. And the reason for that is because in the enemy bullet, it has a script called move that as soon as it's created, it will set its own initial velocity. So again, that's a component of the bullet. So we can take advantage of this and we can say, well, what I really want is for my enemy ships not to be able to shoot anymore. So I'm going to turn off, I'm going to take off that component. And when I do that, so now my enemy ships are still playing the sound, but they're not actually shooting anything. Oh, I'm still not very good at this. <laughs> the other thing we can do is say, you know what's cool? Those enemy ships kind of loop out of our way. And the reason they do that is because they have this script called evasive maneuver. And the evasive maneuver script is used during the physics update to randomly and an angle of the ship. So I can go into my asteroid, this asteroid here, and I can say, I'm going to add a component to this, and I'm going to search for the evasive maneuver script and add that to my asteroid. <laughs> and then I can go over to enemy ship, and I can find its evasive maneuver components. I'm, I'm going to see. So, actually, I'm going to do it like this. I'm just going to copy this component. So I can get all those public variables and I'll paste the values. So all those values will get set. And so now, if everything worked according to one of the 3D game demos, any of you played with that? So you see that in those examples, they have the whole <coughs> level set out. They've got objects sitting in different locations. And so usually in those type of games, the only thing you're spawning are the enemies or the transient objects. Everything else is kind of laid out ahead of time. But in a 2D platformer like this, you'll kind of just create the boundaries and spawn everything. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you, this is before I walked in, but where do you actually like spawn the enemies? Or what? Oh, good question. Yeah, we didn't look at that. That's important. OK, so there's one game object that we need to look at. This is the game controller object. So typically, there is one main object that you set up in the game. And the game controller object is just like any other object, except it will have some script that will start everything off. So again, it's got a transform. It also is holding an audio source, which in this case is the background music. And if we look at the script, <coughs> we see that basically what it does is when the start function gets called at the very beginning, it will set some initial conditions, the score, the game over condition. And then it does this thing called start coroutine. Start coroutine is kind of Unity's easy way to do multi-threading. So when we start this coroutine, it'll say run this function, but anytime the function says yield, then return control back to the main loop. Because even though there are all these things moving around, there is only a single thread. Everything is happening on one thread. So we have all of the enemies, all of the physics, all of the logic, all on one thread. So there are ways to do multi-threading, but you can't update any APIs from a background thread. It all has to be on that main thread. So basically, inside this spawn waves thing, <coughs> what it does is it says, give me a random 
thing from the hazards array. We'll look at that in a minute. Then create a random position for it within a certain range. Give it a random, ro give it a normal rotation, and then create that thing at that position with that rotation, and then yield for a few seconds before you spawn anything else. So this gives the rest of the game objects time to move around. And if at any point the game is over, then you show the restart text and give the player the ability to, to restart the game. So that hazard array is created here, and it just says any game object can be a hazard. And so if we look here at this array, we see that we have our three asteroids and our enemy ship inside of our array. Now we can make things fun, and we could do something like this. We could create two extra spots, and we could say that one of our hazards is going to be random lasers that just shoot. <laughs> Too bad you can't put a code right there. And so now, if we play this, maybe we'll see a random laser. We might not. It might disappear. Or you disable the bolts. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, we have to set the speed and stuff. But. Oh, the asset store is back up. Okay, let me show you this. Yay, it's a flying pig. <laughs> All right, so, so this works basically just like the App Store on Apple or Android. So I can look for everything that Unity has made, which will be a bunch of free tutorials. And you can just download any of those asset packs, they call them, and see exactly what they do. You can download all this cool 3D scenery for free, so you could create your own Viking village shooter game. You could do all kinds of, which would be unfair to the Vikings. <laughs> There's a bunch of 2D things. There's some three-dimensional models that you can rig up for animation. There are all kinds of different options, and they all usually have a tutorial that corresponds with them. Okay. But basically, again, the thing to take away from this is that yeah, they, yeah, that you can get a job there just making what they call educational materials. So this game loop is what drives everything. Every component, as it's loaded, will have its start function called. Every component that has a fixed update function will have that function called at set periodic intervals. And at every frame draw, the update function of every component in the active game will be called. So one thing is that we can't always predict the order of these update functions. So our asteroids might all update before our player does. And so we need to take that into account. Now in later versions of Unity, they have added a way to specify the order that those scripts get updated. But most people don't rely on that. Because a better, it's better to have these be completely independent. So, any other questions? All right. Oh, wait, there's one more. Oh, just one more. Um, so, would you consider like behavior, this kind of behavior of these programming, like similar to like mixings? Or is it the same idea, or is it slightly different in some way? Well, it's like, you know, it's kind of like that. It's also kind of like interfaces, and it's kind of like uh, Haskell monads. I mean, it's kind of like a lot of these things, but it's also a little bit objecty because all of these things have this, we have this main object, and we can have, we can take advantage of inheritance because the reason we can put asteroids and ships in the same array is because they're all game objects. And so it's like, uh, amalgamation of everything. Okay. Um, so I guess we can switch over. So the, the next thing is just uh, a demonstrate, like a tutorial on basically how to get it started so we can all follow along. Oh. So it's just actually working with Unity. Okay. That's, that's really all the other 30 minutes is. Oh, okay. Well, um, does anyone not have Unity downloaded? I know how to do that. 
All right, you're good. So if you've got it downloaded, what I would recommend you do, so in it, and this depends on whether you are interested in creating a 2D or 3D game. So I'm going to recommend you go to unity3d.com slash learn, and there are a set of tutorials here. And there are several different options. So this is the easiest one. And if you've never used Unity, you should start here. You're basically creating a game where a ball rolls around and bumps into squares, which is pretty cool. This is the 2D, it's a 3D simulation of a 2D game. This is a survival shooter game with zombies. This is an isometric two-player game where you have two people playing together. This is kind of interesting because the levels are all generated procedurally by code instead of you drawing them. And then this is an older thing that's not on there. That's only for 4.0. All right. So what I would recommend is everyone start here because it walks you through the Unity interface. Um, however, it's not something we can complete in 30 minutes. Yeah. Yes? Through the Unity interface, mm -hmm. generally the same whether you're building 2D or 3D? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, so the difference, so there, again, there are lots of different components to this, but the main difference between 2D and 3D is how we're controlling the camera. Right. That's really the only difference. In fact, if you wanted to switch from a 2D to 3D game, you would only need to modify the cam how, where the camera sits in space and whether it's using orthographic projection. So I don't really have an easy demo that I that we can go through in okay. fifteen minutes. But then does anyone fine. have any other questions? We can that's do more fine. questions. No one has any questions. And... Oh yeah. <laughs> so when editing in this program, what would the layout look like for something like say have you ever played Robotron? Uh huh. If you made a dual joystick style running gun on a basic 2D overhead 3D ish plane. Okay. Good question. So, one of the things, if you notice here, when we're looking at the player script, it looks at the, it says input, tell me whether this button is being pushed. Now, inside of Unity, <clears throat> so under project settings input, you'll see we've got this input manager. And so we can configure all these different buttons and axes. And then we can query, so we can say that my, these, this horizontal and vertical are going to be the WASD keys, and these are going to be the arrow keys. And so I can query and say, if this is being pushed, move my player. If this is being pushed, shoot my gun in that direction. And so you can query all of these independently. And so that's how the 2D tank game actually works, is that this set controls player two, and this set controls player one. But you could also set it up where you've got like a dual shock controller type thing where one axis is movement, the other axis is your visual camera angle. But all of that is controlled the same way with looking at the just asking, is this button being pushed? Yeah. Um, how, how do you? I don't know if this is something you can show in a short bit of time, but like, how do you like deploy it? Like, whether that be like. Oh, like, see, now that's actually really fun. Yeah. So. So somewhere. I'm pretty sure it's. Yeah, build project. Yeah, that's it. So build settings has the list of platforms here that we can use. So basically, you can say I want to deploy it to the Unity web player. 
So it'll load in a browser as long as they, the person has the browser extension installed. Or you can say, I want to build a PC, Mac, or Linux standalone executable. And you have to build those separately and specify the target fitness. Um, you can build for iPhone, Android, all these other things, Xbox, Blackberry, the Samsung TV. A lot of us probably play games on our Samsung TV. <laughs> um, now, some of these, though, require additional frameworks to be installed. Some of them are not free. I think they put them all here to tease you. The other thing is, if you have mobile builds, you have to do some extra things with the input settings to handle the touch screen, and if you want to use the accelerometer or the kind of gyroscopic orientation features, then you have to do separate code for that. And you have to query and say, if I'm on a mobile platform, use this logic. Otherwise, use this logic over here. But yeah, generally, it's supposed to be pretty easy. So I noticed on there I had uh, PlayStation 4, Xbox 360. I was wondering, and I know it has Wii U on there, how would you actually get it from the, like once you finished building it on the computer, how would you actually get it to the console? You have to, so with the Xbox and the Wii and the PlayStation, you have to have a developer, developer agreement with the vendor. And so like the, you know, Xbox is called what, Xbox One or Xbox Live or... What is the Xbox thing where you can download games? Is, oh, it live. Live. is it live? Yeah. So if you have an Xbox Live developer account, I don't know if they send you an easy way to test on the console or not, but in order to publish through that route, you have to have a developer account with them. Same thing with the Wii and the PlayStation. That kind of thing, you may actually have to buy the developer's kits and consoles as well in order to be able uh, to burn your game onto the specific disks and code everything so that way it can actually be read or rendered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with this, the Unity deployment model, they do, it's not set up for like commercial hard copy de deployment. It's uploaded to, like if you go onto the Wii, you can download like Super Mario Brothers 1, right? And so you can set up your game to download like that so mm -hmm. that people can download it. But again, that does require a developer's account. There's usually a licensing fee and an approval process. And stuff. Same thing with the iPhone and Android's free. Though. Yeah. So this is a higher level, I guess, just a good general question. I'm, I'm glad that I came today. This is one of the, I've seen that we've had like lots of new things today. I come from more like creative background and things and I, I came in late, but as I've been able to adapt it, this is really cool because it helps you be a lot more creative. It gives you the creative tools you know, exposed to you. As she, she's been showing me sort of some of the stuff that you've been talking to. And so, you know, I come from like a music standpoint and making everything, you know, are you able to sort of be able to program different music or different artistic elements into simple things? Yeah, like so, tutorials or yeah so the thing you probably want to look at is that pr procedural based game because what it's doing there is using mathematics to generate the level on the fly. And a lot of times you can generate sound and other effects procedurally as well. The other thing, if you're a real creative type and you just want to have this logic in the game but you don't know how to structure the code, a lot of times you can download GUIs from the asset store. Like let's say you wanted a game where this guy, this character is going to move around some path in search of some obstacle, but you don't know how to program that. You can download an asset that will open up a separate window that will let you say, have him start here and then go here, 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 and here, and don't bump into anything physical. And it will figure out all that logic for you. And so there's a lot you can do without actually writing any code. But at some point, if you want to make it kind of behave the way you want, you will have to code something. But there's a lot you can do before you get to that point. Yeah. So I, I, love, I love the programming thing that I've been learning for most classes. And I know it's beyond me. I'm just figuring out right now something. I'm envisioning later on. Yeah, I would re I would really recommend going through the tutorials. There are video versions and transcripts as well. They really walk you through 
click this, type this thing, this is what's happening. So it's really, it's really designed for someone just starting out. Do we have any more questions? Mm -hmm. I that, that was okay. So okay. how do you do like levels? Is there an easy way to do that, or do you have to kind of make that in yourself? Or? No, it's pretty easy. So, so here we've only got this one scene. Every scene can be a level. And then you just have a main scene at the beginning whose job it is to programmatically decide which scene to load. It's just a script that gets called. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's it. All right. Thank you so much for coming here today. <laughs>